want you to see this. Allow me to be your eyes. Freaks of the Vine, a controversial podcast answering tough questions regarding issues of the day from a practical biblical world view. Our guest tonight is uh, Dr. Sam Storms, and he is someone who we've been looking forward to having on for quite some time. Uh, might as well tell you now that this is a geek time for me. So uh, Sam earned his uh, bachelor's degree in history uh, from University of Oklahoma, master's uh, in historical theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, and his doctorate in intellectual history from the Univers University of Texas. He is the author of nearly 30 books. Is that about right, Sam? That's somewhere around there. That's in the ballpark. Right on. Including, in my opinion, what, what I consider the textbook on understanding correct end times or eschatology as we know it, and that is entitled Kingdom Come. Uh, he is self-described as an amillennial, Calvinistic, um, charismatic, credo-baptistic, complementarian, Christian hedonist. <laughs> He has been married now for 50 years to his wife, Anne. They have two daughters and four grandchildren. And after a very impressive resume, which includes seven years at Metro Church in Kansas City, where we know he had to find love for all things Royals and the Red Kingdom Chiefs. Uh, he is now the lead pastor at Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City, and he joins us via Zoom. Dr. Storms, welcome. That's good to be with you, and you are right. I am a huge Royals and Chiefs fan. Out a boy! <laughs> I knew we were in good company. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, we uh, we appreciate you coming on with us. Uh, so, Doctor Storms, we're a newer podcast. We've been on actually. This will be our our eighth episode, and um, and regardless of how long we have been doing this, we are we were very grateful for uh, um, any opportunity we get to, a chance to talk to somebody. Um, to be honest with you, I, I know you don't. I know you're a humble man, but with your caliber, uh, I, I've followed you for a long time. I actually, uh, the book Kingdom Come has. Uh, I, I fell into the amillennial camp by complete accident, and that's by by actually reading the Bible. And uh, <laughs> that's the best way. Yeah, right. Uh, I no, I tease my friends who are uh, pre premillennial, but the the main thing is I. I think the the greatest achievement for anybody is is just to read the word and get a better conviction. And there are certainly good believers out there who are um, have dis disagreeing views of eschatology, but they uh, I always feel like the amillennialists are right. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but biased anyway. Well, Doctor Storms, to your to your left, my right is uh, uh, Zach, and this is Kay. And I, of course, am Pastor Patrick, and this is Gage, who the operator, who finally got her sound working really well now. So, hello. Well, it's good to see all of you. Thank you for taking the time out of your evening on a Tuesday night. Um, I think we want to jump right in. We want to okay. we want to ask you some questions. We right. we've been discussing some things over the last several weeks, and to be honest with you, sir, we. We could probably uh, not just, you know, uh, grab your thoughts on some of these things, but actually we, we really want to know um, for some clarification. How about that? So um, I think uh, Zach, Kay, Gage and myself all had a question. And, and uh, why don't we just jump right into it? I, I want to ask you about uh, we have been talking about the rapture last week. We actually had a discussion of it. Um, from a non-millennial perspective, it's it's kind of tough to explain to people that we don't believe in what we what has become known as the secret rapture of the church. Um, we believe that uh, we will be caught up um, from uh, at the second coming of Christ. It's a lot of people have then they still go well. Okay, well, when is the seven years? When's the three and a half years? So could you kind of just um, uh, you, you know you were in a dispensationalistic school really? Uh, could you kind of share with us your your journey a little bit of what happened to you? Sure. Yeah, uh, Dallas Seminary, great seminary. I'm very um, thankful for the education I got there. Uh, great professors, uh, but it is very dispensational. Um, I, When I first went to Dallas Seminary, I was a committed dispensationalist, believed in a pre-tribulation rapture, pre-millennial. Um, and really the, uh, the change began for me um, in my second year 
when in a class on the Greek exegesis of the book of Ephesians, and we were randomly assigned, I say randomly, I, I want to say providentially assigned a certain paragraph on which to write our paper. And I was given Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, uh, which describes uh, how God has, by the blood of Christ, incorporated Gentiles into what he calls the commonwealth of Israel. And they are made fellow heirs and citizens um, and heirs of the covenants of promise. And the more I looked at that passage and all of its implications, I began to think, you know, this distinction, this radical dichotomy between Israel and the church just doesn't seem to bear up under what Paul is saying. It seems like Paul is saying that believing Jews and believing Gentiles are now one new man and are co-heirs of the covenants of promise. So that was a, that was a major uh, issue because um, the the kind of traditional pre-tribulational rapture view is largely based on this idea that God is going to remove the church so he can deal once again with his covenant people, Israel. Um, this idea that there are two separate peoples of God with two separate covenants with separate inheritances for the future. Um, and if this, I, this is kind of the foundation for the idea of, of a pre-tribulation rapture, um, so the more I, I studied this issue, we, had, we actually had some pretty heated debates and arguments on the campus because at that time, uh, the books of George Eldon Ladd were being circulated. Um, and Ladd was very much a post-tribulational premillennialist. And so most of us just began to examine uh, what the Bible said about the second coming and this idea that the second coming happens in two stages separated by seven years just didn't seem to hold up under close scrutiny. Uh, it seemed as if um, the second coming and the rapture were simultaneous. They were one and the same event. Um, the Lord Jesus returns in the clouds of heaven. Uh, he translates or raptures all believers unto himself. We receive at that very moment our glorified uh, resurrected bodies, and then we continue with him in his descent to the earth, at which time he defeats his enemies and consummates his kingdom. So, yeah, the idea that there is a, a coming of the Lord in the air and we're translated up to him, and then we go back into heaven with him, uh, and then all of a sudden people look around and say, where did all these hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people disappear? They just, they vanished. And then supposedly this seven-year period of uh, persecution and tribulation ensues. And then at the end of which, of course, the idea is that Christ returns, and um, those who have come to faith in him during that seven-year period are themselves glorified, all of whom then enter into this millennial kingdom. It's a, If people are listening to this and they're saying, gosh, that sounds awfully complicated, it is. It's incredibly uh, complicated uh, in a way that I think has led a lot of people astray. I think there's really a simplicity to the purposes of God in the second coming of Christ uh, that doesn't require that we multiply resurrections and multiply uh, comings and multiply judgments. I think there's a singular coming, a singular resurrection, a singular judgment uh, that leads into the eternal state. Um, so one other thing I'll just throw out there, uh, it's kind of a controversial point, People ask, well, what about the so-called Great Tribulation? Mm -hmm. Isn't there going to be a seven-year period preceding the Second Coming during which Antichrist, you know, oppresses the people of God and the earth? Now, I do believe there's going to be Great Tribulation as we approach the coming of Christ. Undoubtedly, I think that is true. I think, I think there's going to be a global assault on the Church of Jesus Christ. I think there's going to be a, a unified uh, attempt on the part of the enemies of the kingdom of Christ to crush the church. I think we are beginning to see, I say beginning to see, that, that's almost an insult to our Christian brothers and sisters on the other side of the earth. They're already in tribulation. Absolutely. I mean, seriously, Thank if I, you. this is kind of a little rabbit trail here. I get frustrated with people who talk about, oh my, we're going to go through per persecution. We're going to go through tribulation. I'll say, go talk to your Christian brothers in North Korea yep. who've been in prison for 20 years and being tortured on a daily basis. Exactly. Talk to those in Indonesia and the Sudan 
and um, in, in various places throughout the earth, uh, in Middle Eastern countries where they're imprisoned in Iran and elsewhere, there could be no greater tribulation than what these people are enduring. And for us in the West, to just bemoan the idea that we might lose some of our freedoms and suffer a measure of persecution is an insult to those faithful believers who've been enduring for years and decades, even almost in some cases centuries, horrific oppression. Um, so that's my little sermon out there. I kind of got off. And now you will find mind. absolutely no objections here, my friend. That was yeah, well, completely well agree. said. Thank you. Yeah. So the point being, I do believe there will be increased tribulation, increased persecution and oppression to the church leading up to the second coming of Jesus. It's going to be severe, but I think the church will flourish through that period of time. I think there will be glorious outpouring of God's saving grace and uh, the power of the Holy Spirit during that time to sustain the church. But I don't believe it's necessarily going to be seven years in length. It could be seven weeks. It could be 150 days. It could be uh, nine years. Who knows how long it will last. Um, I think the great tribulation, using the language of Jesus in Matthew 24, referred to what happened leading up to and consummating in the, in the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple in 70 AD. That, I believe, was the Great Tribulation. Um, I do believe, however, that that was in a sense kind of a, a blueprint or paradigm for what will happen on a global scale at the end of the age. But I don't see anything in Revelation or anywhere else that would lead us to believe it's going to be precisely seven years in length. Amen. You know, I uh, I went through seven weeks of, of Revelation a couple of months ago, and I I took the I, I explained the viewpoint uh, of the fact that the book people read the book they refer to the book a lot without having any knowledge of what it reads, which is very common. They go, "Well, everything that happens in the book of Revelations," you know, they always erroneously put the S in the end of the book, but, but it's, it's, it's a misnomer because we've grown up. If you're in the seventies, late great planet earth, if you're in the, you know, the 80, the late eighties and nineties, obviously um, um, the left behind series made this alone. And it was almost my son, Zach here reminded me uh, that I, he was a young kid and I took him to the Christian bookstore and took him to the uh, left behind series for kids. Right. Oh man. It was a huge end cap. You know, major display. It, it caught your attention, you know, as an adolescent. Yeah. And you know, it was just, you know, it was I remember that whole Left Behind series just blowing up for a couple of years, man. And it, it directed kids too. you know, it was like, you know, you just read this and it was, you know, the the whole consensus was, you, you know, like you had put. Um, I'm not going to try to summarize it, but, you know, that <laughs> seven years of hell on earth basically for, for those yeah. who were left to either come to find grace or to be left behind for a second time. And it just, yeah. it, it seemed to be a work of fiction. The more you read it, it's like, I mean, there's this whole rabbit trail that we're going off into sci-fi land now, instead of going actually rooting to the word of God. Yeah. And the sad thing about that series of books, both Lindsay's and the left behind series is that it became so, um, uh, embraced by the broader evangelical world that yes. it became identified with Christian orthodoxy. Yes. Yeah. Almost to the point, because I experienced this firsthand, that if you were to question the pre-tribulation rapture, if you were to argue and contend, as I just have, that the rapture and the second coming are simultaneous um, events, it, it was almost worse than denying the deity of Christ. Uh, it was. It, it came to be such a closely held and very personally cherished idea. Oh, thank you, God, you're going to deliver me out of this world. I'm not going to have to, to you know, be thrown in prison. I'm not going to be persecuted. I'm not going to lose my li religious liberties. Thank you, Lord, for setting me free from that and for to stand up in front of Christians who've embraced that their whole lives and tell them, I just don't think that's what the New Testament teaches. Um, it is, there's a real sense in which it's dangerous uh, Christians will come after you, not necessarily physically, but uh, they will assault you and defame you and conclude that you have abandoned the inerrant word of God because you don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And it's really sad that this doctrine has been elevated to such uh, heights of so-called Christian orthodoxy. Um, 
it's it's really hard for a lot of Christians to believe that there's actually another view. Why do you think that doctrine is hung onto so tightly by people? I mean, they would rather defend that idea than actually look to uh, investigate the matters themselves and just read what the text of the Word of God has to say for itself. I think Western Christians have become uh, anesthetized due to the the comforts and the protections and the liberties that we have. And I think the idea that what we do see happening in Iran or um, or North Korea or similar or other places on Earth, that that could ever come to the United States of America. I mean, let's be honest. The idea of the pre-tribulation rapture is almost a uniquely American doctrine. <laughs> yes, you don't it find, is. You, you don't find yeah. Christians in, in the United Kingdom believing this. You don't find Christians in Europe believing this or in, um, in most other places. And if you do find it, it's only because it's been exported from America, from the West, the, where we live in such comfort and freedom. Um, and I, I think it's just because there is this um, this passion to be set free from any kind of pain or discomfort or um, the loss of our liberties. I mean, the prospect of being thrown in jail, the prospect of, of uh, losing, um, you know, our, our homes, our livelihood. This, is, this has been standard fare for Christians down through the centuries, and we've become rather softened and numbed by um, the, the presence of all these physical comforts in the West. And the idea when you come to people and say, I don't believe Jesus is going to come get you out of this mess so that you can be in heaven while everybody else has to endure this horrible time. That is offensive and threatening to them. And, it, and honestly, it's scary. And they're not prepared for persecution. And they need to be. Amen. Yep. Uh, so we, we, we actually... Uh... That was something that, uh, uh, not, not to personalize this, but I want to share this with you. I preached a sermon several months ago um, to warn people that the word tribulation meant suffering of all time. And the NIV has classically been, uh, uh, you know, one of the texts that, well, they've removed the word. They soften the blow by taking the word tribulation and usually insert the word suffering. Or trouble, which bothered me because I felt like it's because it didn't fit the agenda of that word when it comes to a dispensational view. And, and, and I don't think I'm wrong on that one, but I think it's just softened the blow. Uh, one thing that I wanted to share and, and, and get you to kind of share with us your experience in, in the early 80s when you did um, finally actually make a stand for this. Uh, I want to throw something at you. It's kind of a monkey wrench, but I'd like you to comment on this. When we read in the obviously the, 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 the way that the millennial pictures are, are all put together from premillennial post and amillennial all come from the, the 20th chapter of Revelation mm-hmm. about the thousand years. One thing that I, I constantly beat uh, down when I'm talking about this topic is to get people to realize that we have um, when Satan is bound for the period of time, which we read as a thousand years, it is, it is there for one purpose only. And that is for deceiving the nations. And then I hearken back to when the Holy spirit, um, was given, obviously breathed in the disciples. And then the spirit of tongues came upon them in the upper room at Pentecost. At that point, the only people who really truly believed in God were in a very small region in the middle East. And in order for the word to go forward, Pentata ethne, is that it needed to it needed to take root at that point. And I feel like um, as you talk about in the kingdom come about Satan's the deception being, you know, uh, basically bound in chains for a period of time, lose for a little while. Do you do you ever think about the idea that since the mid 1800s with, let's say, dispensationalism really confusing the masses, um, you know, Seventh Day Adventism, um, the different uh, cults that have popped up over the last 150 years. Do you do you ever think about the idea that maybe this is a period of Satan being loosed because we're so deceived now and confused? I know that's kind of out there a little bit, but I was yeah. just wondering what your thoughts are. Well, I, I think it's certainly a possibility. Yeah, I, you know, I do believe, you know, a lot of people would, uh, in fact, this is one of the major arguments that's thrown back against those of us who are all millennial. They say, how can you believe that Satan is bound um, 
given the fact that he seems to be, you know, Peter says he's prowling about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And first John five nineteen says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Well, revelation 20 is very clear. Um, Premillennialists have typically expanded and universalized what John says is very limited. John says, here's what it means to say he's bound. He's prevented from gathering the nations of the earth together to uh, launch a global assault against the church. In other words, uh, what we call Armageddon, you know, the final battle, the final assault of this, of this ungodly uh, world against the church and kingdom of Christ. That cannot happen while Satan is bound. Doesn't mean he can't tempt people. Doesn't mean he can't deceive people. Doesn't mean he doesn't blind the minds of the unbelieving lest they believe the gospel, 2 Corinthians 4. Simply means that in this one respect, he's not able to, to provoke what I call a premature um, um, Armageddon. He cannot, he cannot foment or facilitate that final global assault until the time when he's released and able to gather the nations. But does he, in fact, in the present day, deceive people and lull them into a false sense of security uh, and even into false doctrine that um, that kind of reinforces their their spiritual lethargy and this sense of, well, I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to necessarily prepare myself or my family for... um, period of great tribulation and suffering, I'm going to, I'm getting out of here. Jesus is going to take me home. He's going to, he's going to come and remove me. Um, That just misunderstands the fundamental nature of the Christian life. A false sense of entitlement, which is brought on from, from who knows where I think it's, it's the pampered Western culture. It is in, in a nutshell. Yeah, it is the pampered Western culture that we have become so accustomed to our, comforts uh, that we can't envision. And, and then this is the idea that surely God would love us too much to leave us here to suffer that way. Well, doesn't he love the Christians in North Korea? <laughs> he love the Christians. Uh, Amen. Yeah. I read about yeah. on a daily basis who are being imprisoned in Iran. Vody uh, Bauckham said it amazingly. He said, um, look, look at how God poured out the wrath upon his only son. What makes you so special? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, so, yeah. I think that the misunderstanding of what tribulation really means is, is what we've grown up. And it was easy because in the 1980s, mean, we think back, I was born in sev- early 70s. And so, you know, it, life was pretty, really simple. And, and even in, in growing up in the hood, it wasn't that bad in the late 70s or early 80s. You know, it's, it, it, culture has is, is changed a lot. Dr. Storms, um, uh, we had a couple kind of roundtable questions. If you don't mind sticking with us for just a couple, we won't want to keep you too long on a Tuesday evening. Sure. But, um I do want to ask you specifically if you can enlighten us a little bit on on something about spiritual giftedness. And, and this is a, a, a people who don't understand. There's a big debate between cessationism and continuationism. So basically, if you can hear that word in cessation means a cutting off. Continuation means we're going to go forward with it. Um, it's been a big debate, especially over the last 500 years, I think, with the Reformation and probably longer, but especially during that time. Uh, it really is a theological dispute as to whether the spiritual gifts remain available to the church, whether their, uh, their operations cease with the apostolic age um, coming to an end back with the apostles. Could you please explain your view and why you hold to that, why you're still a, um, a continuationist? Yes. Well, I wasn't always one um, because Dallas Seminary was not only dispensational, they were very cessationist, still are. Um, and it wasn't until the late 1980s that my theology in that regard shifted. And it wasn't because I saw a miracle or had an experience. I just went back into the Word of God and began to question the arguments that had been given to me by my professors in seminary and um, suddenly realized that the arguments they gave for the cessation or the ceasing of certain spiritual gifts just wouldn't hold up in the light of Scripture. I just couldn't find it. I couldn't find a text that actually taught that. Um, in fact, I, I've many times asked my cessationist friends, can you give me a text that tells me that these gifts were only meant by God for about 50 years of the life of the church in the first century, and that God does not design them to function 
um, uh, for, until the time of the second coming of Jesus, because said, I can give you a lot of texts that seem to clearly indicate that these gifts operate until the second coming. It's, it, it's ironic that the one text that cessationists often use was 1 Corinthians 13, and the idea when the perfect comes and that which is partial will be done away. But when you look at the text, the perfect there is a reference to the final state of glorified consummation when Christ yeah. returns, because it says, then we shall know, even as we are known, we'll see face to face, which is biblical language for kind of the beatific vision, the final encounter with the risen Christ. And so it seems to me, Paul is saying that gifts like a prophecy and knowledge and tongues will continue until the second coming of Jesus. Um, so I looked at, I, I look at the purpose of the gifts. I say, all right, why did God give them? And of course, the argument of the cessationist is, well, he gave them exclusively to confirm and testify to the authenticity of the apostolic message. And I say, give me a text that says that. Mm -hmm. um, there is none. And even, and here's what I do. Let's just concede for the sake of argument that one purpose of gifts might have been to bear witness to the authenticity of the early apostles. What makes us think that's their only purpose? The fact of the matter is, spiritual gifts serve a variety of purposes. Paul says they were given to build up the body of Christ, to edify, to encourage, to console, to glorify God. Um, so all of the, there are a multitude of purposes of spiritual gifts that are not exhausted by this idea that they confirm or authenticate um, the, the message in the first century. So. You know, the idea that God would call upon us to, 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 as it were, build the kingdom and not give us the tools necessary to do so just never made sense to me. So mm -hmm. well I, I actually have um, had a book released. I don't know if you've gotten it yet. Uh, came out September 1st called Understanding Spiritual Gifts, a Comprehensive Guide. It's on my list of to read, my friend. It's a it's a it's a big one. It's um, <laughs> I think it's well over 300 pages. And I tried to. Uh, I have, an, I have several chapters in there on this debate, cessation versus continuation. One of the arguments of the cessationists was, and it's interesting, when you're in a seminary class and you're listening to men that you love and respect, and I still love and respect them, and they say things, you just kind of, yeah, okay. I remember hearing multiple times, these gifts died out in the early church. You know, you look yeah. after the death of John and the first three, four, five, six hundred years, they just disappeared. That is just blatantly false. And I have an entire chapter documented original sources where virtually every one of the prominent church fathers and apologists in the first 500 years all affirmed the ongoing operation of all the gifts. Uh, Augustine is, is the classic example, the most famous theologian probably in the history of Christianity outside of Paul. He was a cessationist for a season and then in his retractions, at the end of his life, he said, hey, I have personally witnessed no fewer than 70 miraculous healings in my own parish. And he said, these gifts are still operative. Healing is still operative. Prophecy is still operative. Um, so this idea that somehow these gifts disappeared, you hear that argument. That's just not true. And uh, so anybody listening to this, I just hope you'll at least look at the evidence that I present in that chapter. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know where they got that idea. I think it's probably because somebody else that they respected said it to them yeah. and they never bothered to actually read the original sources to see if it were true. And I can assure you it ain't true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear like I have a lot of respect for John MacArthur. There's, there's things that I disagree with him vehemently on, but, but most of the time he is a salt. And, and it's, it's important to remind everybody that I think, although like you may have a different point of view on a couple of pieces of theology with MacArthur at the end of the day, you both love Jesus Christ with your Absolutely. whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, and, and I know that, you know, I, I think we we're in a time where if we call out our, our, our friend smile and Joel down in Houston, People get, you know, angry and want to, you know, well, you shouldn't say anything bad. No, no, no. When you're blatantly misinterpreting the scripture, that's where, where Paul called out a couple people is important for us to bring that to light. Doing sure. so in gentleness and respect, 
failing well, to preach the true gospel. Amen. Is, is yep. what Amen. Yep. Uh, obviously, when we're talking about some non-essential, you know, disagreements or things that we could, you know, somebody might feel like speaking in tongues. I have the gift of tongues. I actually, we were having a class tonight and it went a half yeah, hour. How, how funny was the class that we had tonight? Yeah. On Over this exact thing. Yep. <laughs> it, it was just, we were supposed to just kind of step on that. We were going through the spiritual gifts, the listing of it. We got to that point. We had people who had come from a, chris, a, a, a kind of a perversion of the charismatic, almost an, a new apostolic reformation, you know, yeah. uh, view of uh, the gifts. And so they have a bad taste in their mouth from, from that. We have other people who have a Catholic background. So we have a lot of, we have a very unique, interesting uh, blend of people in that class. And uh, the conversation needed to go on. And so we explained it, you know, and I explained, no, I, yeah. I, I, I have the gift, but I do it in the privacy of prayer time have a couple other pastor brothers that we're, we're actually planning to get together and praying and seeing if someone gets an interpretation. There's nothing wrong with, with doing it, but, but doing it in a chaotic form in the middle of a church service, obviously tell us right what, when you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell well, us. I have the gift as well. And, um, I exercise that gift almost every single day. Amen. I actually wrote a book called the language of heaven, uh, which is about a 250 page book on the gift of tongues. <laughs> so I explored every text, every interpretation, every argument, pro and con, go into great detail um, and address that. So the language of heaven, uh, I would recommend uh, your listeners to get a hold of that if they want to explore this deeper. I think, you know, if I can circle back around for just a moment to, Please. Uh, to John MacArthur, John is a good and godly man who preaches the gospel a gospel identical with the one that I preach and that I would die for. Amen. I think what oftentimes motivates him, and I think some others who are cessationists, and you kind of alluded to it there, it's not so much something they've seen in the text of Scripture. It's what they've seen on the Internet or on TV or on a platform of some conference where somebody did some really goofy things and uh, claimed that it was the power of the Spirit. And they manipulated people, they fabricated healings, they uh, pretended to hear the voice of God when in fact they weren't, and they get, and we get so offended, and rightly so, it offends me deeply, it angers me, but the problem is people say, oh my, if that's what you mean when you talk about spiritual gifts being operative, I don't want any part of it, and yeah. it's the fear factor, the fear of guilt by association, Amen. The fear of, oh my, if I, if I walk down that path, I'm going to end up like them. That's what keeps people in the cessationist camp, not the teaching of scripture. Yeah, amen. It's, it's, the, it's the abuses and the, the manipulative fanaticism of certain groups that drives people away from the true and proper and biblical use of spiritual gifts. I have, I have confessed in my book that that fear was one of the, one of, if not the primary factor that kept me in the cessationist camp. Uh, I was so offended by those who were bringing reproach on the name of Christ in the name of the Holy Spirit. And um, then I just began to realize, well, wait a minute, the Corinthians were doing the same thing, but what did Paul tell them? He didn't tell them to shelve the gifts or to suppress the Spirit. He said, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So the answer to abuse is never disuse. It's proper use. It's bringing correction and following the guidelines of Scripture. Amen. Um, before I let the rest of that, that I want to let everybody here, they have a question for you. But before we, we jump to the next question, I, I wanted to just bring this up to you. And in a, in a, when we talk about the, the gifts like that, when you, when you look at it from a whole perspective, can, um, uh, can you just tell me when, when you begin to, how do you concede to your wife, because I know that's got to be the first person who you've driven nuts with when you were talking about writing Kingdom Come. Okay, the people you see in this room are so done with me talking about the amillennial perspective, because as I went on this tangent, you know, because I it was like I read the word and I there's find, a horse in the corner over there you can't see <laughs> that's been beaten. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've backed off of it now, Doctor Storms. But I had yeah, I, I when it finally came to me, uh, I, I had to, I hey I'm I'm on my way with you, sir. I wrote one book. And I think, I think 
62 people have purchased it in three years. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. But uh, Got to start somewhere. Got to start somewhere. But I had an experience with Ron Rhodes. Um, actually, I read one of his books at the end of my time. It's uh, Christian Leadership Institute, Christian Leaders Institute. And I had a problem with the book. And I approached him in person, of all places, at a place I'll never go to again. It's called Worldview Weekend, but I, I digress. But I went to see him, and I, I approached him about it, and he gave me the worst answers. He avoided me, and then he got on the elevator and cold-shouldered me. And that was – I'm not saying anything bad about Mr. Rhodes. I'm just saying that that was my experience, and it was something that I, I finally got to the point where I'm like, okay, there's something to this, and I'm going to reject. But how, how much has Ann put up with you for – what is it? How long is it now? 47 years? Uh, actually, it'll be 49 in May. Oh, you know, we've been married. Lord Amen. B- <laughs> Lord bless her. Lord yeah. bless her, brother. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> um, you know, even to this day, she still struggles with the amillennial scheme because she was so indoctrinated with the dispensational model. It's, it is hard. I mean, this is something people need to understand. If you've been indoctrinated with that view, and most evangelicals have, that's the traditions in which they were raised. If they were in a Bible-believing church, if it wasn't Presbyterian, probably, that's pro- most likely the view that they heard. It's become so ingrained in their thinking, they can't break out of that framework to, to look at and listen to Scripture in any, in any other way. And so that's been, um, that's been a challenge for her. She's just happy Jesus is coming back right now. That's yeah, kind of how we have <laughs> landed and, uh, yep. and uh, are happy with each other as we agree that uh, Jesus is coming back personally, physically, visibly to consummate his kingdom. And uh, she doesn't bother herself with what happens before or after. She just knows he's coming. The issue that was more difficult for her was the spiritual gifts issue. Um, because I had, um, and I say this to my everlasting shame, I had really quenched the spirit in her. I had um, suppressed and quenched the spirit by ridiculing charismatics and speaking so uh, negatively and critically of those who were doing things that I thought were contrary to the word of God. And so when I began to make this, this transition and began to affirm my belief in the gifts and prayerfully pursue them, she, she thought I'd kind of lost my mind. And um, now She's the one that I kind of have to rein in. She is one fiery, spirit-filled woman. Um, I guess I'm making up for lost time. All Amen. the time I quenched the spirit in her, now I have unleashed the spirit in her. <laughs> now you're dealing in with gloriously it. good ways. But That's that awesome. was the issue that was that was even that was far more difficult for her than the, my transition to amillennialism. Amen. What was harder, the amillennialism? Well, yeah, I was going to say which one was more difficult, but you just answered that. That's awesome. Zach, had a, uh, you had a question for Dr. Storms? Uh, yeah, yeah, I sure did. Um, Dr. Storms, I just had a quick question about uh, prophecy. And, um, you know, we, we are warned in, in Scripture about uh, false prophets, and there will be false prophets amongst us, you know, and amongst, you know, men and brothers and sisters. And I was just, um, I was just curious, just asking from a man um, who shares – the same profession as my dad now does of, you know, educating God's people on the word and helping them along as a shepherd. What can you kind of give out hint and tips wise? What can we use as far as discernment from the Holy spirit to look out for those false prophets? Great question. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I would say, and this catches some people by surprise, the only people that are called false prophets in the new Testament are unbelievers, Hmm. unregenerate people, who reject the incarnate Christ. Unregenerate. They are, there, there's no place in the New Testament where somebody who, um, who claims to be a Christian, who tries to deliver a word of encouragement to somebody and maybe doesn't get it 100% accurate, Correct. they're not yes. called false prophets. False prophets are unbelieving deniers of the deity and the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that needs to be clarified. Very, right from the very good clarification. Thank you. Um, the fact of the matter is, Every Christian who's operated in the gifts has prophesied falsely. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 13, we prophesy in part. That's why he says in chapter 14, judge prophetic words, weigh them and analyze them, test them against scripture, uh, pray for discernment. 
the same thing in First Thessalonians 5, where he says, do not despise prophetic utterances, but judge everything. Hold fast to what is good, reject what is bad. So we are all fallible. We are all um, uh, prone to error. There are times when I was convinced, I thought I had sensed from the Spirit of God something about an, a person or a situation, and I was wrong. There have been other times when I was spot on accurate. Well, you just got to learn to live with that. I mean, let, let me give you, let me just give you a, 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 the analogy that I think will be helpful. Okay. Basically, what happens is when people hear what turns out to be an inaccurate prophetic utterance on the part of a Christian, their tendency is to say, wow, that means the gift of prophecy is fake. We got to throw it out. We, we got to suppress it. We got to write it into the bylaws. We'll never allow that to happen in our church again. Well, let me ask you this. People who say that, have you ever heard a bad sermon? <laughs> I preached a few. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you, brother. <laughs> yeah. Have you, have you ever heard a, a, what you thought was a good and godly Christian individual misinterpret the text of scripture and misapply it? Yes. And the answer is, yeah, all, unfortunately, all the time. Yeah. Uh, it happens all the time. All of us, Patrick, you and I, we, we've, I, I, the number of times I have misinterpreted scripture and misapplied it over the last 45 years of Christian ministry, it, it boggles the mind. Um, but nobody comes to me and says, well, we're going to throw out the gift of teaching. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get it perfect and it, the text is right there in front of you in black and white and you misinterpreted it and you misapplied it to my life. I'm ruling out teaching. We're going to write into our bylaws. The spiritual gift of teaching can no longer be used in our church. Yeah. Nobody does that. <laughs> Why do we treat the gift of prophecy differently? Somebody makes an error there. Somebody misunderstands and misapplies um, something that God may have truly revealed to them, but we just immediately want to push them out and label them her heretical and crazy and we suppress that gift, but we don't do that with teaching. We don't do it with, I've seen people with the gift of evangelism browbeat unbelievers and do a horrible job of sharing the gospel. Amen. But I don't say, well, gift of evangelism, no longer operative. We're not going to use every spiritual gift can be abused. Yeah. Every spiritual gift, even the gift of mercy which my wife has, you can go overboard and show mercy to somebody that you need to hold accountable for their actions. But we don't dismiss that gift because somebody did it badly. That's a great point. Um, so yes, there are going to be instances when prophetic utterances are off base. What does Paul tell us to do? Judge them, weigh them, evaluate them, test them against scripture, test them against your own experience. You remember in, uh, in Acts 21, when uh, Agabus and the four daughters of Philip and others prophesied to Paul, hey, you shouldn't go to Jerusalem because you go, you're going to get the heck beat out of you. You might even die. And Paul says, well, I'm sorry. I appreciate your concern, but the Spirit of God's already testified to me. You go back and read in Acts 19 and 20 that I'm going to be persecuted in every city. And Paul ended up going to Jerusalem contrary to their counsel. So they meant well. I think they understood accurately that if Paul goes, he's going to be persecuted, which is exactly what happened. Paul said, well, I knew that. Spirit of God told me that many times. So we always have to test prophetic words by what we know God has communicated clearly, especially in Scripture. I think we have to test it by, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, 3. Prophecy edifies, encourages, and consoles. So you got to ask the question, was that prophetic word edifying or, or did it tear down? Did it console or did it create despair? Did it encourage or did it discourage? Those are the kind of criteria that we employ to test the validity of any prophetic word. And again, I just keep coming back to 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, think about it for a moment. This is the church in Thessalonica, one of the most mature churches that Paul ministered in. And they evidently had grown weary of the gift of prophecy. And people say, why? I say, probably for the same reason that you are. <laughs> somebody <laughs> abused the gift, somebody manipulated somebody, somebody gave a word and it didn't come to pass. And what does Paul say to them? Don't despise prophetic utterances. If you despise them, if you suppress them, if 
you reject them altogether. Paul's saying you have sinned. In fact, he even says that is quenching the Holy Spirit. So, well, yeah, you get me on a soapbox when you bring up. No, the- you're oh. good, man. I, but, but on a question with that, you you were comment. You had a comment that was a, a, conclude, a conclusion of an article that was written in Christianity Today, which I I quoted it to several people actually. Um, I thought it was great. And it was an article that was getting on to John Piper kind of talking about when he was obviously not supportive directly of, of President Trump. Uh, and, and so your your quote at the end of that, you said it's really difficult. I want to paraphrase what you're going to you, what you said, but you, you basically put it out perfectly. You were like, this is we have two very flawed candidates. And isn't it something that you know, we're in a position for the United States of America to be put here that we're our only two options are very flawed candidates. It was so perfectly worded, sir, that that I think we it really inspired a lot of people, I believe, to go, okay, yeah, you know what? We're praying for God's will to be done. And it doesn't seem like it's enough. We're not a political podcast, but yet every time we always seem to to land on a political because the election has been recent and all that. But, But let me ask you, though, with this said, with the as far as the to follow up to Zach's question, when you have somebody like Paula White and and her prayer, the strangest prayer after... Are you sure it was a prayer? No, that's it, exactly. <laughs> and, <Yep. laughs> and and so so when you when you you know I don't want you to I'm not asking you to to, to beat the the, right. the obviously yeah. elephant in the room, but yeah. can you kind of I mean we've had a lot of people concerned about you know she's the spiritual advisor. Um, she yeah. teaches over men, which automatically removes her, as far as I'm concerned, um, from the validity. She's not supposed to. But what, what was your thoughts when you heard that bantering? That wasn't a prayer. That was incessant that was banter. Babble. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad. Um, I don't know her. I've never met her. I, I hope and pray that she's a, a true born-again believer in Jesus. Um I don't think she denies any fundamental of the faith. I don't think she denies the deity of Christ or salvation by grace or the bodily resurrection. So I'm, I'm operating on the assumption that she's born again. Like I said, I don't know if she is or not. I hope and pray she is. Um, it's sad that, um, that she gets carried away like that because I, that she's a classic illustration of what I was mentioning a moment ago. You and I sit down and talk with an average evangelical believing friend about spiritual gifts, and that's what they point to. You mean Paula White? That that that's what you want me to do? That's what you want me to believe and practice? And that's what that's what's heartbreaking. I want to say no, for whatever reason, whatever her motivation may be, and I don't know, and I don't I don't profess to be able to see into her heart and know what is prompting her. But it grieves me because it's that kind of behavior that brings reproach on the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't know if it's because she got, um, you know, being kind of having an open door into the Oval Office and having immediate and direct access to the most powerful man on the planet. um, That's a heady thing. That's that can really inflate somebody's. Uh, confidence in their own ideas and mm-hmm. uh, and and kind of put them in a place where they think they're above criticism and above being uh, um, checked, as it were, in terms of what they say and do. Maybe that contributed to it. I don't know, but um, yeah, it was it was embarrassing. Um, honestly, mm-hmm. when you say what did I do when I saw it, I immediately <laughs> clicked off of the program. I <laughs> honestly just couldn't even bring myself to watch it. Yeah, all. amen yeah. to that. Um, it's, it's sad. And again, um, I, if she is a genuine sister of mine in Christ, I'm going to love her. And uh, we'll talk about this whole thing when we get into the new heavens and new earth. Amen. And yep. we'll say, Paula, what in the world were you thinking? And I think she'll <laughs> probably say, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> At least I hope, I would hope yeah. she would say that now rather <laughs> yeah. than having to wait until yeah. eternity. Some reproach. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I have a uh, question for you, Um, and I hope I'm saying this word right, Uh, preterism? Preterism. Preterism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Full and partial, I I know you know all that probably, but um, so some believe that the prophecies already happened, 
and then that there's still some to come. Some believe that it's that's done. Um, I, and why the two beliefs? Oh, it's a sure. great point. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, full preterism is the idea that all biblical prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD when God brought judgment on the people of Israel, destroyed the nation, destroyed the city, destroyed the temples, dispersed the people um, uh, throughout, uh, you know, the inhabited earth at that time. And that everything that was prophesied in the New Testament, even the second coming of Christ took place in 70 AD. And that his second coming wasn't a literal, physical, physical, personal coming, but it was his coming in judgment against his covenant people, Israel, because of their idolatry and rejection of the Messiah. They, the full preterists, and I don't know how they do this, they actually believe the new heaven and the new earth was inaugurated it's in 70 AD, that the judgment, the resurrection, all these things took place, but they took place in a spiritual nature, yeah. not in any kind of physical or literal way. Uh, I just think that's that's borderline heresy. Um, it, it might even have crossed the line into full-blown heresy because if somebody's denying uh, the futurity of the um, bodily, personal, visible return of Christ to consummate his kingdom, that's that's very dangerous. Well, and you're, crossing the line. You're denying what Peter said. You're denying what Paul said. You know, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you have to go through and omit quite a bit of the New Testament in order to yeah. make that work. But, but the partial preterism, which is what I embrace, basically says, look, what happened in 70 AD was profoundly important. It's talked about repeatedly in Scripture. I think the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, is primarily about the events leading up to and consummated in the events of 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. But that doesn't mean that I believe the second coming happened then or that other prophetic utterances happened then, or that the, you know, the final judgment, the bodily resurrection happened then, uh, those things I think are still future. So I'm, I partially embrace a preterist view in, in that I say, yeah, a lot of what you believe uh, came to pass in 70 AD um, when Titus surrounded the city of Jerusalem and destroyed it and, and you know, basically raised the temple, uh, left no, no stone upon another, very significant, fulfilled the prophetic utterances of Jesus, um, but I don't believe that was the consummation of all New Testament prophecy. So that's the difference between a full preterism, which I think is borderline heresy, as over against a partial preterist view, which is the one that I would embrace. Okay. Thank you for your clarification. Gage? So I know we uh, talked about the rapture earlier, um, but I just wanted to know if you could... Uh, Explain what the term actually means of the rapture relating to the second advent of our Lord. Well, the word rapture itself, as you know, does not appear in the New Testament. Um, it comes, um, there is a, uh, it, it's usually the, the translation of the Greek word, which means to, to seize or to catch up. So there definitely is a rapture in the sense that, as 1 Thessalonians 14 says, we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Um, so yes, people who, who find out I'm all millennial say, oh, you don't believe in a rapture? I say, well, of course I do. If you mean by that that Christ is going to return right. and gloriously translate his people to himself Amen. and glorify their bodies and, um, and, and and to be in conformity to his body, the answer is yes, of course I believe that. I still believe it's going to happen in a secret way seven years before the second coming. Um, so the second advent, the second coming, the rapture, all of these things, I believe, happen simultaneously uh, at the end of the age. Now, I don't know if that answers the question you had in mind. Yep. Uh, yeah, the, the, the idea of being caught up basically is what I was looking for. But, yep, I, I think it answered it perfectly. Yeah, it's interesting, by the way, um, and I'm, you all probably know this, but uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, when Paul says, and we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, that actual Greek verb translated to meet was used in uh, not only in, in the book of Acts, but in extra biblical literature to refer to a custom in the ancient world 
where uh, when a dignitary would come to visit a city, the, re the citizens of the city would go out to the outskirts to meet him and then to escort him back into the city. They kind of constituted his parade, as it were. That's the very concept that Paul is, is expressing there. He's saying we are going to be caught up to meet Christ, and then we are going to constitute, as it were, his glorious parade, uh, his retinue, as it were, as we descend with him to the earth when he will consummate his kingdom. Amen. Uh, so it's a beautiful picture of what happens in both the rapture and the second coming, which happen again um, simultaneously. They're one, one, two parts of the same event. Uh, please don't take this the wrong way, but it is ultimately so satisfying that after I've put my neck out there teaching what you just said for several times, just, you know, having to just navigate through the barrage and the muck and the swamp of dispensational mindsets that what you just said, I exegeted to the T. So I just feel better <laughs> that I wasn't wrong, that Sam Storms taught. Okay, so I know. I, I tell you what. Yeah, just blame it on me. I'm just going to blame <laughs> you, brother. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there, yeah. All right, so a, a quick parting shot because we, we need to know this. What position did you play in baseball? <laughs> I was a pitcher and a third baseman. Nice. Okay. Do you strike out John Piper? 20-year-old oh. Sam Storms, 20-year-old John Piper. Do you strike him out? Oh, absolutely. Out of one. <laughs> <laughs> what an answer. Right John, John is many things. He's a dear, dear friend of mine. Um, I hope he doesn't take offense at this. A great athlete, he isn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that would make us want to ask if he would strike out Fodi Bauckham. Uh I have no idea. No, no, it, it's just it had to be asked. You know, Vody was obviously a the offensive lineman, so. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was a huge offense. I don't think he played in uh, baseball when he grew up, but he was definitely a great football player. He played at Rice, so uh, he's very good at that. Um, all right, well, listen, you know, you have uh, you have a lot of people, Kim Riddlebarger, uh, Helkema, some great authors that have embraced the same. They've come out of the same camp that you have, that I have. It's not easy to talk about, but I tell you what, it is it is perpetuated completely by reading and studying of the scripture. And and I, that's where the conviction needs to come in. So so as you leave us, would you please give us a parting shot? How would you just recommend to folks who are navigating their own way through this? They're actually finally falling in love with scripture instead of listening to somebody else tell them what it says. They're actually reading it for themselves, Bible-based church. What advice do you give to them as you as you as we leave you today, sir? Yeah, I, I would advise them to do what I did, uh, which is actually what led me to my amillennial view. Read the New Testament, asking yourself this one question. What do the New Testament authors say is going to happen when Jesus comes back? This is a very simple question. What do they explicitly say will happen when Jesus comes back? And when I asked that question and I went into the New Testament, I saw repeatedly, they say, all physical death will end. Death is swallowed up in victory. There will be a resurrection of all mankind, the just and the unjust. There will be a judgment. Um, there will be a renewal of the earth. Um, there will be a casting of the unbelievers into the lake of fire and Christians enter into the new heavens and new earth. And I kept seeing this consistent emphasis in the New Testament, what happens at the time of the second coming. And then when you see that, ask yourself the question, where do I fit a, a thousand year millennium into that? And the answer is you can't do it. Amen. Uh, because the things that premillennialists say will happen at the end of the millennium New Testament says happen at the time of the second coming. That to me was the decisive factor in why I embraced an all-millennial view. So it's a very simple question. Just say, what is, what's going to happen when Jesus comes back? And then let the New Testament answer that for you. Amen. I want to thank you also for making a stand on being a, um, a, a Bible um, expositor and not, not giving into this uh, whole woke movement. We are obviously as believers, we are, uh, tenderhearted to every human being, no matter what the color of their skin, but to, but to give way, um, to social stuff, 
and and in, in lieu of the scripture doesn't make any sense. We really appreciate you being such a firm, uh, you know, stand. You've stood firm for the scripture, for the word of God, and, and Dr. Storms, we couldn't be more grateful for you taking an hour of your time tonight. Thank you so much for joining us on, on Freaks of the My Bible. pleasure. Yes, sir. Yep. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you. You bet. Lord bless you. Talk Go. to you soon. Go Chiefs. Go Chiefs, right man. On. That's right. 10-1. and one. We're going to keep it rolling. <laughs> All right. Take, Take care, care, sir. All right. Goodbye. Bye-bye.